Working with metal has always been a challenge for the Dr. D Flow shop. I can drill holes and cut sheet metal, but fabricating custom metal parts for my DIY projects has always been out of reach. I'm hoping that problem ends today with the acquisition of my brand new Precision Matthews 833TV. Now I'm not a machinist by any stretch of the imagination, so this is not going to be a tutorial on how to run a mill. But I am going to show you how to convert this manual mill into a CNC one. Dr. D -Flow. If you've never seen a CNC mill conversion, then you might not know that this requires the mill to be completely disassembled. Now why can't we just replace the handles with stepper motors? Well, there's an inherent issue with the lead screw drive system found in each axis of the mill. This issue is known as backlash. Now would be a good time to mention that if you are new to CNC motion, then I strongly recommend watching my previous video on all the parts and theories that go into building a 3D printer. I cover topics like backlash that are applicable to many different CNC builds like the one we are working on today. A seasoned machinist is able to compensate for backlash. But this is difficult for a CNC machine to do. It is better to use a drive system that has very little, if any, backlash, like a ball screw. A ball screw may look like a normal screw, but the threads are designed to act like helical raceways for the ball bearings found within this special nut. To substitute the 833T's lead screws for ball screws, we have to take apart each axis. On paper, this conversion seems straightforward, but when you start to factor in um, the weight of this mill and the need for a hoist, it gets a little bit more complicated. Now that we have the z-axis disassembled, we can take a closer look at the linear motion setup of this mill. Most manual mills, including this one, use dovetail waves to restrict the motion of the carriage in one dimension. The problem with dovetail waves is that there's a lot of metal on metal contact, so lubrication is key. One of the reasons that this mill stood out to me compared to its various competitors on the market is because this mill has a one-shot oiler. One pump of the lever will send oil through the lines lubricating not only the ways, but also the screw. We need to be careful when installing the ball screw not to snag any of the oil lines. The first step in the Z-axis conversion is swapping out the old lead screw nut block for the ball screw one. The mounting holes on the new nut block do not align with the old holes, so we're going to use an adapter. 
This adapter plate is close to aligning to those old holes, but it needs to sit a little bit farther down. There is some interference from the casting, so we're gonna take an angle grinder to the two corners of this plate to create a little bit of extra clearance. Even within the same make and model, there is some variability that exists between the castings of these cheaper import mills. So whether you fabricate your own plates for your conversion or you purchase a kit, be prepared for some material removal to get everything to fit. Now we need to add the oil lines back on. There's an extra oil line to oil the ball screw. Nice. Cool. At the top of the Z-axis, we're gonna use angular contact bearings and a plate to hold the Z-screw straight. At this point, we could attach the Z-axis motor, but that would increase the length of this column, and I'm already worried about clearance issues with the hoist. So I will install the motor after the column is back on the base. Next, we need to insert the give, which is a tapered piece of metal that will take the play out of the carriage. You don't want the gib to be too tight because this will result in excessive wear of the dovetail ways. You are probably wondering how I got a hold of these ball screws that are the perfect length and these machine plates for attaching the screws and motors. While it would be possible for me to source these components from online vendors and the local machine shop, I decided to purchase a conversion kit from Bruce Nelson over at Heavy Metal CNC. The kit greatly expedited this whole project and the quality of the components is awesome. We're about to start the ball screw conversion for the X and Y ways, but before we do that, I want to quickly talk about one more selling point of this mill over its competitors. This mill comes out of the box with hand scraped ways. If you're not familiar with hand scraping, well basically it's the process of creating an ultra flat surface. An ultra flat surface means a better fit between two components, and in the case of mills, it's going to allow for smoother motion. On many hand scraped surfaces, you'll find these half moon flakes. These flakes act as divots where oil pools. Now, instead of having a metal on metal contact, you're having a metal on oil. My fear of clearance issues with the column was justified when we took some measurements and realized that there's just no way for the column to clear the base with my low 8 foot ceilings. We had to shorten the chain on the hoist, which made this whole lifting procedure a little precarious. So please don't copy how we rigged this lift. I'm pretty excited, the mill is put back together, but we can't celebrate yet because we need to make sure that the column is square to the table or it's not gonna operate as it should. The best way to figure out if the column is perpendicular to the table is to throw an indicator into the spindle and then run it up the edge of an engineer's square. 
Now, if the column is leaning towards the square or leaning away from the square, the distance on the indicator is going to change. Now, we can correct this leaning by introducing a thin piece of metal underneath the base. This is known as shimming the column. Over about 8 inches or 200 millimeters of travel, the indicator changed about 7 thou. Now, the way in which it changed, I know that the column is leaning towards us, so we need to place a little bit of shim underneath the front of the base in order to make it lean back and correct this. Shim comes in all different thicknesses. Now, I could use a little bit of trigonometry to figure out approximately what thickness shim would correct this lean, but there's a lot of factors that go into this, and it's almost easier just to guess and check. So we'll try a couple different thicknesses of shim. Oh my gosh, you got it so high. Come on, Patrick. Hold on one second. Oh, back on, Patrick. My man. We shim the column with 0.3 millimeters, but now we have the opposite effect. The column's actually leaning back. So we're gonna meet in the middle and do a 0.15 millimeter shim. The next and last calibration that I'm going to do on camera is going to be to tram or adjust the tilt of the spindle. In CNC milling, we want the spindle to be precisely 90 degrees in respect to the table. It's easy to adjust the angle on a benchtop mill because many of these models are made to tilt so that you can drill at different angles. How do we know when the stock is perpendicular? Well, we can check with this indicator setup. Basically, we sweep an indicator between two gauge blocks that have the exact same height. Now, if the headstock is not perpendicular, it's slanted one way or the other, then when the indicator gets to the next block, its reading will change. We can then loosen the bolts on either side, tap the headstock in whichever direction makes sense, and then retighten the bolts, resweep the indicator, and see if we're getting close. When I finally reached a tram that I was happy with, I got about a thousandth of an inch difference in height between the gauge blocks, which are 13 inches apart. We're almost finished with the mechanical portion of this build. We just need to reinstall the one-shot oiler as well as the way covers. Now the way covers are really important in protecting these precision ground surfaces from projectiles that are created during the cutting process. Next, we need to talk about the electrical control system that powers and coordinates the stepper motors, which ultimately makes this a CNC machine. While I was waiting for the mill to arrive, I assembled all the electrical components because I need to be able to control the motors while tramming the mill. I was trying to be as efficient as possible because I was renting the engine hoist by the day and I didn't want to return it until I knew that the mill could move accurately in case I had to disassemble it and fix a problem. I will bring the electrical cabinet over to my bench and we can talk about the setup. I do want to point out that my mill's current configuration is about as simple as it gets. I have, or will soon have, control over three motors, three limit switches, and two probes for finding my tool and work offsets. More capable CNC mills will be able to adjust the spindle speed, automatically swap tools, activate coolant pumps, and so much more. While these features are necessary in a production setting, I have not decided which ones are worth the added cost and complexity for my little garage operation. I'm going to run my mill for a couple of months in this bare bones configuration before making any upgrades. I can tell you already, just from swapping in and out my indicator setups, that a power drawbar will be coming to this mill in the near future, so get subscribed and follow my Instagram so that you don't miss any upgrades. When building a 3D printer or other low wattage CNC machines, it's not a huge deal to have your controller board and wiring exposed. However, to move the axes on this mill, I needed large power hungry stepper motors. As power requirements go up, everything gets more dangerous. I'm not just talking about the potential for a nasty shock, but any kind of interference with the electrical signals could cause the mill to act erratically. Here is my quick disclaimer. I am not an electrical engineer, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. 
Always ask questions when unsure and never work on a circuit that is under power. I will upload the wiring diagram for everything in this cabinet to my website and I will update it as I find safer ways to wire everything and or add new components. Continuing with the theme of safety, an electrical cabinet such as this one is a necessity to keep coolant, debris, and fingers away from the electrical components. To get wires from outside to inside the box, you could drill one large hole, fit it with a rubber grommet, and then stuff all the wires through that hole. However, a better method is to use panel mount connectors. Panel mounts exist for all types of electrical connections, including barrel jacks and the popular Ethernet RJ45 connection. One of my favorite panel mounts are the aviation connectors. They may look a little old school, but it is very easy to solder custom wire harnesses to them, like I did when I hooked up the stepper motors and motion pendant. AC power is supplied to the box through a 15 amp switch which is housed in a 3D printed part that anchors the switch to the cabinet. The switch handles the entire load of the circuit. Now it is more common to use a contactor at these higher amperages and have the on off switch control the contactor's coil, but I had this high current industrial switch laying around. Inside of the box, we have a 72 volt, 20 amp, unregulated DC power supply. The reason I went with an unregulated power supply over a regulated one was mostly because of cost. Unregulated power supplies can also soak up current feedback, such as when a stepper motor is slowing down without faulting. In fact, unregulated DC power supplies will never fault. If you draw too much power, their transformer will burn up. If you're just learning the ropes, I would stay away from the unregulated power supplies. I went with 72 volts because my motors could handle it, and I'm eventually going to switch to servos, which operate in that voltage regime. The power supply feeds three beefy stepper drivers. The model number of these drivers is DM860T. They can supply up to seven amps. The step and direction signals for the stepper drivers come from a Mesa 7i76E. We will talk more about why I picked this controller board when I go over why I chose Linux CNC as the software to run this mill. But for now, let me explain my love and hate relationship with this board. I love it because of how feature rich it is. The 7i76E can drive up to five motors and receive input from a pendant such as the one I have set up. There also seems to be an endless number of digital inputs and outputs, so controlling coolant pumps and solenoids for compressed air in the future will be no problem. The hate part of my relationship with this board stems from the lack of documentation. The manual is cryptic to say the least. A simple diagram of which pen was which would have sufficed. Fortunately, the Linux CNC forums got me straightened out before I fried the board. I will compile and expand on the resources I found most helpful on my website. Finally, in the cabinet, we have a tri power supply, which supplies 24 volts to the Mesa board and 12 volts to the intake and exhaust fans, which are essential for keeping this cabinet cool. Let's head back over the mill. The limit switches have finally arrived, and I will install those before talking about Linux CNC. So we are back over by the mill, and I've made a couple of changes, but let's focus in on the limit switches. I have added inductive proximity sensors that trigger when a metallic surface, like the casting of this mill, is brought within four millimeters. This is a contactless process and is an accurate way to home a CNC mill. There are two sensors located at the minima of the X and Y axes, as well as one sensor at the Z max. I use my custom 3D printer to fabricate the brackets that hold the sensors. These limit switches, while not completely necessary, will give my mill spatial awareness so that there is no potential for it to run into itself. Next, let's talk about both the computer and software that run this mill. The Mesa 7i76E controller, located in the electrical cabinet, is connected by Ethernet to an Intel NUC. The Intel NUC is running Linux CNC. I picked Linux CNC because I liked how the motor control was performed by the CPU and not outsourced to hardware connected by USB which means no buffering of movements and higher step rates. Also, there is a lot of flexibility with this open source software. However, tasks that are simple to accomplish in other CNC programs, like setting up a pendant, prove to be much harder in Linux CNC. But so far, the performance of my mill has been worth the extended setup time. A couple other additions that I made was a touchscreen monitor, as well as a tool probe for measuring the height of my end mills. The touchscreen is showing off a new Linux CNC GUI known as ProBasic. This interface was released at the end of 2019 
It's way more professional looking than the other GUIs that exist, and all the buttons and macros are very intuitive. It seems to be inspired by Tormach's Path Pathpilot, if you're familiar with that program. The last thing I want to talk about before we fire this bad boy up is the spindle motor. This is a two horsepower, three phase motor that directly drives the spindle by a belt. A variable frequency drive that is housed here controls the speed of the motor. There is no oil fill gearbox that needs to be maintained, and this motor is incredibly quiet even when it is revving up to its max 3200 RPM. The VFD is not currently tied in with the electronics, so setting the speed of the spindle is accomplished by manually turning this knob. This will be CNC controlled in the near future. Well, I think that pretty much covers everything, so let's get on with the machining. The first part that I'm going to make is a 96 well chiller block. These are common in biology labs, like the one I work in, for keeping small volumes of liquid from evaporating. These are like the biology version of whiskey stones, but instead of whiskey, these blocks will keep expensive biological reagents cold. This commercial chiller block costs about $100. That piece of 6061 aluminum that's in the vise cost me about $3. So it's time to save some money with this mill. We're gonna use three separate tools for the cutting process. Starting with a three inch facing mill to get the surface flat followed by a 6.5 millimeter drill bit to create the 96 equally spaced holes. And finally, a chamfer tool to clean up the edges of the holes as well as the perimeter of the block. To get started, we need to find the bottom left corner of the stock material because I set that as the origin of the part in Fusion 360. The combination of my digital work probe from Drewtronics with the ProBasic interface makes this process trivial. After the probing operation is complete, the work coordinates of this aluminum block are automatically adjusted in Linux CNC. After switching the probe for this beefy 3 inch end mill with carbide inserts, I'm using the old paper trick to determine the height of the tool because this tool has too big of a diameter to work with the touch plate but don't worry, we're gonna use a touch plate for the future drill and chamfer bits. Well, that was awesome. Some of these machining marks that were left on the surface indicate that the mill's tram needs to be adjusted a little bit more, but I'm happy with this quality for now, especially with this inexpensive facing mill that I bought off of Amazon. Let's move on to the 96 holes that will be drilled with the 6.5 millimeter spiral drill. This time we will use the automatic tool setter. After the touch pad registers the drill bit, ProBasic can then compensate for the height of the tool in relationship to the aluminum block to make sure that we have the perfect starting height. The 
the mill made quick work out of all those holes. I will have to review the video, but to me it looked like the drill went straight down and didn't wander. Finally, we're going to knock down those sharp edges around the holes, as well as the perimeter of the block with the chamfer tool. That chamfer takes this part to the next level. It's time for the moment of truth. Does the 96 well plate fit within the 96 well chiller block? Yes, it does. I wouldn't use the word easy to describe everything that went into making my first part, but I would use the word manageable. From start to finish, this project took a month's worth of weekends and weeknights but I couldn't have done it without calling in favors to a lot of my friends. So big thanks to Patrick, the other David, Sari, Hannah, and of course Andy for making this CNC mill a reality. I have a lot of exciting projects coming up that will take full advantage of this mill. So get subscribed and I'll catch you guys in the next video.